Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to this week's episode in <clears throat> this, uh, excuse me, the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I am extraordinarily pleased to have uh, Barry Vital with me today. If uh, you don't know Barry, you should. He's one of the Bribery Act guys uh, who tells us, uh, shines a light on all things uh, Bribery Act. And I had the opportunity to visit with him a couple of weeks ago when I was in the United Kingdom. And he had some very interesting perspectives, so I asked him if he would share them with uh, our audience. Uh, before I get going, I should uh, note and extraordinarily happy to note and report to you that this podcast is now available on iTunes. So if you type in FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report, you can not only uh, you can now download it from iTunes and listen to it in your car or on your radio or any other of your portable devices. So uh, with that, uh, Barry, uh, we had a really interesting conversation about uh, what's going on with the uh, Serious Fraud Office, the SFO. They, uh, I think, took a, at least a publicity hit uh, recently <laughs> with the uh, release of uh, in some information that they had lost some data. And uh, could you tell us sort of uh, from your perspective what's going on with the SFO? Yeah, um, well, they, uh, I suppose that you could call them accident pro. Um, they, 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 in the UK, those guys are are a political football, and um, they they make headlines wherever they go, good or bad. And there are various factions of people that would like to see the SFO disappear, and others that are quite happy for it to stay. Um, that recent story about the BAE documents disappearing or being sent to the wrong address, which was uh, I saw. Uh, embellished with a, a very nice story which gave a, a picture, a photograph of the place where it was all being stored, uh, which depending on which report you read was either uh, in or next door to a cannabis factory. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's not a great story for them. Uh, and on top of um, the other sort of bad stories that they've had, you know, with the Schengis, debacle and other stuff, um, I think it's a it's a real shame, um, uh, but that said, um, at the end of the day, uh, they are at the moment that some of these stories sort of belie the significance of some of the work that they're doing. And they are uh, f very uh, heavily deployed on LIBOR at the moment. They do have, if you look at the sort of investigations which we know about, or maybe I'm putting it at high investigations, uh, but the sorts of things that they are interested in that has been reported in the media, for example, I think there are reports that GSK has briefed the SFO, that we certainly know that Rolls-Royce has briefed the F SFO, we know that other big corporates are uh, being looked at, we know that there's the sort of long-running EADS investigation, there are a lot of big investigations going on down there. So um, it's really a question of time and um, what I would urge uh, listeners and viewers perhaps uh, watching or listening to this is that don't be duped uh, by some of these stories where um, the sort of the media is portraying the SFO as sort of you know a bungling outfit the fact is um, that they are a serious bunch of prosecutors and you know regardless you don't really want to be in their jaws because if you are they don't mess around so um, I think it's a great shame that they, they still struggle with some of these things, but hopefully uh, we are beginning to see an end to these sorts of stories. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit several times, uh, at least a couple of times, uh, when Howard Sklar and I had This Week in FCPA. And I think one of the things that certainly I was guilty of was too much jocularity in terms of uh, uh, opining when the SFO would uh, bring their first prosecution, uh, giving an over-under. And I guess one of the lessons I've learned in certainly the past year is, in addition to what you just said, the serious nature of the office and the gentlemen and, and ladies who work as prosecutors, but the time-intensive nature of this work. It is, it's, not, um, uh, it's not a fast process. People forget that the uh, FCPA was around a long time before you had truly significant prosecutions. And I think here in the U.S. and perhaps uh, outside of the U.S. as well, we expected the SFO just to pick up, become the DOJ and move forward. And I don't think that was fair, or certainly was not fair for us to put that on them. And when you have some of the massive uh, cases that appear to be uh, percolating along in the United States and China and elsewhere, I think the simple fact that you have international 
legislation, uh, anti-corruption legislation and international prosecutorial regimes uh, significantly slows down the process. Plus, these are document intensive cases with lots of man hours to go through them all. And so uh, I would uh, echo what you've just said uh, in terms of, um, one, you don't want to be in their jaws, but two, if you're waiting for their uh, prosecutions to come online or go hot or bring a, de bring a large prosecution, I think that day is coming, and it will happen when, it's ha when it happens, and it really, um, I think an over-under of, of certainly of 18 months was meaningless, uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be serious prosecutions going forward. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that that's true. I think, I mean, and the other, there are um, ongoing prosecutions or cases under the old law, um, and you're right. And I also think that, you know, we are seeing there is a, the, the Bribery Act was one building block in uh, a wall of other stuff which is happening in the UK. Um, some more things are going to come through at the beginning of next year where we've got the advent of deferred prosecution agreements. We've got sentencing uh, guidance, which I think the consultation closes at the end of this week. Um, and all of this is part of an overall picture in relation to um, criminal law liability for corporates that perhaps was never really there before in any great event to any great significance it seems to me and the back and if you listen to the rumblings now there is significant rumbling there's been rumbling coming from the sfo for a while but political rumbling uh about um coming up with a failure to prevent some sort of failure to prevent fraud offense so basically taking that corporate offense um, of failing to prevent bribery that everyone got so excited about uh, all over the world, including in the US, um, and, and then translating that into fraud. Now, maybe that is some years off, but I think that gives you a flavor of where all this stuff is going at the moment. So I think we can see uh, some pretty, I, I would expect to see stuff happening next year. And I think, frankly, if I'm uh, was advising a corporate now that was sort of engaged in some sort of dialogue with the SFO, and let's be candid, um, that's what you, you a, a company, uh, whether you, being investigated or whether you self-reported or whatever it is, there will be some form of dialogue. If there is a suggestion of maybe if you hung around for a few more weeks or months, you can might maybe get a DPA. Why wouldn't you consider that? Why 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 would you rush? And I think that goes from both sides. You know, from the SFO perspective, if they are, would might maybe would consider a DPA. Why would you suddenly file, file charges and proceedings now when perhaps that would be on the cards in three months' time in the beginning of next year? So um, watch and wait, but it's still coming. Uh, one of the other interesting things has been uh, perhaps the change in direction with uh, the new director, David Green. And there's been a lot of commentary, certainly here in the United States, about his uh, more of a prosecutorial bent, uh, less con consulting or consultative uh, uh, guidance from the SFO, but I would have to, to share with you my observation has been when there's been a newspaper article uh, about one of his talks or his speeches or reports of his speeches, certainly uh, reports on your site, uh, thebriberyact.com, uh, I always find uh, uh, nuggets of information in there that I think he is communicating substantive information to those of us in the compliance community. What's your perspective on all that? I would agree with that. I think that um, if you can cut through it all, through some of the hyperbole, not his hyperbole so much actually, some of the uh, hyperbole of the commentary that's out there about what all this stuff means and cut through to the chase, I think he's got a pretty simple message, which is also pretty hard to argue. And the message is, um, you know, serious wrongdoing, you know, uh, systemic um, corruption, you know, rotten to the core. He's going to go after that stuff. Um, if uh, there is a genuine self-report, uh, which means that somebody comes to him and tells him stuff he doesn't already, wouldn't otherwise have found out, and a genuine effort to um, to fix that problem, then that is something where he will consider, for example, a DPA, or also perhaps consider civil recovery. Civil recovery is still very much on the cards, in spite of what you might have read. It seems inconsistent, that, doesn't it, With, against the backdrop where he's, gonna, he's, he's sort of publicly reported as saying he's going to prosecute everybody, and yet his first case is a civil recovery order. So I think that his position is, uh, in one sense, he is a tougher former, he is a tougher 
uh, former prosecutor. He likes to bring in cases and taking them to court. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think his position is perhaps a bit uh, uh, m much more nuanced than perhaps the media that have reported what he has said uh, ha 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 has uh, described. And actually, if you even read what he says or listen carefully to what he says, I think the position is somewhat more nuanced than perhaps the own headlines he gives to his speeches. But that's okay, because we all like snazzy headlines with some uh, slightly less snazzy content. Um, I myself am a, a guilty of that crime. Uh, I was really intrigued by, I think it was the last post on your site, uh, which uh, had some remarks that he had actually released uh, maybe late last fall or early in the first part of the year. And really what I gleaned with that, you, you hit on the highlight, which is if it's a systemic failure of internal controls or systemic fraud or corruption, he's going to take a very serious look on that, look at that. But if it's an, uh, an isolated incident, a small dollar amount, if the company steps in, remediates, uh, doesn't prevent it, but detects it and, and remediates quickly, he's going to look more favorably on that. And that's really, um, that's an encouraging sign to me uh, because it shows a certain realism, uh, not only in terms of prosecuting under the law, but also of marshalling of his resources. But I think that information's out there. And I think you're right. If you kind of can cut through uh, the, either the headlines or the reporting, there's some real nuggets in there. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, this is common sense, isn't it? And it's what everybody wants. Um, and the SFO isn't the only show in town. I mean, there are others. I was talking to um, a representative of the City of London Police, for example, and they are the biggest economic crime uh, law enforcement agency outside of the SFO in the United in the UK. So pretty big, pretty important. Um, and they say uh, their message, interestingly, is a bit more is, is different uh, to the SFO's message. Uh, particularly in relation to facilitation payments, where what they described to me, and I won't, I won't do it justice by paraphrasing it on this webcast, but was frankly more in line with perhaps the six steps or the guidance that, that was previously there from the SFO. But broadly, uh, you know, it's a common sense approach. I mean, we don't see really the DOJ going out and prosecuting a $5 uh, facilitation payment to expedite a visa. We really don't see that. And I know what everybody says, but we don't see the SFO doing that either at the moment. If you look at the track record of cases and the clues in the name, they are the serious fraud office. They're not interested in that stuff. They can't say it's OK, go forth and bribe, can they? Because it's against the law and their law enforcement. That would be very odd. But I really do think that we, we need to get some perspective. And people just need to um, to try their best. The trap with all of this stuff for people is that they they um, when we both know Tom that you know the truth is if the, if if you are permissive and allow one facilitation payment to be paid, it's never a one-off basis. It's going to repeat, repeat, repeat. And what will they will do? And frankly, what the DOJ will do is aggregate all of those things up. And if they right. think there is a right. lot of money, uh, if they think you know. If to, to liken it perhaps to litter. Now, if I walk down the street uh, in the UK and I toss a Snickers wrapper on the floor, I would be pretty upset if the police came up to me and arrested me for littering. On the other hand, if I drive down the street with a dump truck packed to the rafters with trash and I proceed to stop at the lights, uh, lift up the dumper and dump it all over the road and drive off, I think I'm going to get arrested. And that's sort of where we are, isn't it? Right. The, uh, now I'd like to turn to um, sort of the thing that's really interested me over the summer, which is uh, GlaxoSmithKline or GSK and the uh, at least alleged trouble they've gotten into in China. Um, well, the, the, I think they're in trouble in China. <laughs> in trouble. We can make that a vermin, even as lawyers. <laughs> Okay, uh, so they're you know perhaps in trouble in China, uh, so perhaps in the United States, perhaps in the United Kingdom as well. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I saw a lot of implications for compliance worldwide um, from the Chinese enforcement action against GSK, and I thought it was significant because for two for for a couple of reasons. One is the direct action by the Chinese against a Western company. Certainly that had happened in the past, but this was. Uh, very public, 
uh, very large and uh, sent a clear message to the Western business community. But uh, in moving into the realm of speculation, I thought that you know perhaps some other countries who uh, uh, are perceived to have problems with corruption may move towards Western companies as a panacea for their own internal problems with corruption. And, you know, India, Russia, the Stans, you know, you can name the countries or geographic areas of the world. And I know you had a really a, a, a bit of a different view on this. So could you share uh, kind of your views on GSK and what it might mean for the compliance community going forward? Yeah, well, I think um, I think GSK has, uh, depends on your definition of trouble, but if you're a corporate and you don't like your name in the press, and if it was in the press with lots of bad headlines, that would be trouble. Then they've got heaps of that. Um, whether or not any of this stuff is true or not, who knows? Uh, there is definitely um, a war of words going on in the media, or at least if they're not waging it, the Chinese appears to be waging it, um, because there is sort of a tip for tap going on in terms of when GSK says something, the Chinese come out and say something, it seems to me, which is designed to undermine what they just said. And it may well be that there are, and in fact, I'm not, I'm a realist, it's quite likely, it seems to me, that there are political overtones to all of this in terms of some other motivation. Um, but actually, that doesn't really matter, because the catalyst for uh, uncovering wrongdoing, if that's what there's been, is really of no consequence to law enforcement, it seems to me. Um, I, my, my perspective on it was, was that there's plenty, there is no shortage um, if you, uh, of uh, compliance failures for Western companies in China. You're right, it is sort of knew that they are going after Western companies. But is it really a surprise? Um, it's been telegraphed. Their new leadership has said that they're interested. They may be somewhat self-serving about that, but they are. They, they, uh, I have Google Alerts out every day. I get hits with people telling with, with Google Alerts telling me about another Chinese bribery case, another public official that's being prosecuted. My favorite uh, was the guy who I think recently got convicted, who bloggers outed because he was photographed, I think he was a transport policeman or something like that, and every photo of this guy next to a plane or a car or whatever it was, he was wearing a very big shiny watch on his wrist and it wasn't the same as the last one. Right. And, <laughs> and so they, they, they determined that this guy uh, had a penchant for expensive watches which couldn't be funded by his $50 a month salary or something. Um, and he's been taken down. So the Chinese have had form for going after corrupt officials for some time, and this has got to be a natural extension of that. Uh, so I'm not really that surprised by that. I think that um, you, you, you mentioned a point which I sort of would agree with, perhaps from a slightly different perspective. You can assume, and we have seen, that companies under FCPA investigation um, well, may well go into some form of global review as part of their compliance processes, because one of the questions which presumably regulators and probably their own internal people are going to ask is where else could this have happened? You know, was this guy who or were these people that were doing what the alleged people alleged they were doing? Were they, were they always in China? Did they were used to work in our name your country, Stan branch, for example? And if they did, what are the chances that in this new place they started for the first time? Perhaps they did it before in the old place. And so these things have a habit, unfortunately, uh, of spreading. And um, so I can see that perhaps the compli a, a compliance review may reveal uh, what I describe as imperfections <laughs> elsewhere. Perhaps. Perhaps. We're lawyers, <laughs> after all. Indeed, indeed. Um, is, uh, could you describe or have you been able to communicate that thought, which is, now might be the, a good time for companies to um, internally review their processes and procedures, take a little more detailed look. Are you uh, are giving some guidance to clients or in talks and speeches or on papers and uh, or on your website uh, based on these new developments out of China? Yeah, I mean, I think, we, yes, we are. And um, many people are interested in that at the moment. Um, and they certainly, I think, uh, and in a heightened sense of um, concern about what's going on in China. Um, so, but to be fair, really, we're just beating, banging the drum. I mean, we've been coming out with the same message. I mean, I'm, I would hate to say I told you so to anybody, but I mean, we've been saying, we've been, we've been selling a consistent message right from the get-go, uh, albeit we've taken hits uh, on the, along the way about um, the failure of law enforcement and, hey, people should just get on with it and continue until perhaps the SFO uh, get, get, on their, uh, get on their horse and get out there and do something. 
the reality of all this is um, that it is coming, it is going to cause you problems, whether it's, you know, if you get involved in bribery in a foreign country, and guess what, suddenly for political reasons, the situation changes, uh, then you are exposed, whatever that is. So, um, and I, you know, the... I know that you and Howard spoke about this on many occasions, but it is possible to do business ethically in these places. It's a whole lot simpler and a whole lot risky, uh, a whole lot less risky. And um, you know, we have been preaching that gospel wherever we go for a long time, and we'll continue to preach it. And these things um, are really just handy illustrations for us of what we've been saying, and I know that you've been saying for a long time. One thing. I wanted to add, though, for companies out there that are thinking about this is, and um, they may or may not choose to listen or uh, believe or think that what I'm saying is right, is that I do think when we are seeing, you know, law, people focus on law enforcement all the time, and they focus on the big stories, like the GSK story, who knows what the story is there, but it's a nice headline. The slightly more dull reality of life is that um, you are pretty much one. The, the law enforcement risk is a percentage. Uh, if it's a double digit percentage, that's pretty high in my book. But what's 100% likely is that at some point on some uh, RFP, some tender that you're putting in, some warranty and agreement that you're going to sign, you're going to have to say to somebody what your compliance program is like, that you haven't had problems. And, it, and, uh, and how can you say that, right? And, so, and, and if you're unlucky, you might come across a global company, and there are plenty of global companies out there with monitors that have their own problems or under investigation, and they just might be a little bit more interested than getting the, yeah, we've got one. And they might just want to come in and have a bit of a, a closer look at what you're doing. And, you know, you can really, I think, I think for some companies dealing with global Fortune 500, FTSE 100, FTSE whatever, saying that they have a robust compliance program, which actually withstands a bit of scrutiny, like when the questionnaire comes out and you say, this is where it is, this is what we're doing. Yeah, we know what, we haven't completed all this stuff yet because we know it's a rolling program. Everybody gets that. Um, but people will actually want to do business with you because you are less risk to them from a commercial perspective. And I think there's a real commercial angle here which the bulk of the commentary completely miss because they're totally focused on the latest FCPA case or the latest investigation, wherever it is on the planet. I mean, you know, it's a bit like celebrity. The day-to-day -day is you've got a contract, it's just coming, it's full of reps and warranties, and somebody's asked a bunch of questions. And how are you going to deal with that? We're going to have to save exploring that in depth for another uh, podcast because we're at uh, the end of our time. But uh, that was a very interesting thought. And um, I would uh, just leave it with, I had considered your point about wanting to do business with companies in compliance. But the point I just heard you raise was, as a business, you m may want to engage with companies that bring less risk to you. So uh, that's what I'd really like to explore at a further date. Um, Barry, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to visit with me and our audience today. Once again, he is one of the co-authors of what I believe to be the best site, on the, certainly on the Bribery Act and anti-corruption in the United Kingdom, thebriberyact.com, a partner, I didn't mention this, at Pinson Masons in <laughs> London. Uh, and uh, in addition to his anti-corruption and anti-bribery work, he is also a software and technology lawyer extraordinaire, so uh, multifaceted, multi-talented, and if you need some help, uh, certainly I would give, uh, give Barry a call. So I appreciate it, and uh, thanks very much. Thank you.